Welcome to a model steam engine test plant, part 28. Remaking the check valve adapter for the hand pump and live steam injector with a different design. Using stainless steel instead of leaded bronze, this episode contains more lathe work than usual. In this clip you can see the original check valve adapter that I made. It was made in two parts on two separate occasions because originally I wasn't going to use a live steam injector as well as the hand pump. As a general rule, I would make a video and then voice it over the following morning. But in this case, I didn't do that because I was working in Leeds on a Hammond organ in a recording studio. And here I am in a really well-equipped recording studio owned by a friend of mine, Mr. Jason Brooks. I'm working on a 1967 Hammond L102, which has two broken keys, thanks to the studio manager dropping something on it. I've worked on Hammond organs for many years, so I know how to do the job, which is not as easy as it looks because you have to lift up both keyboards to get at the mechanism and replace the keys. Doing the job took two and a half hours yesterday morning, and including the drive from York to Leeds and back, I was unable to voice over the video, so I'm doing it now. I'm starting off by removing the gas pipe adapter because with that in place, I cannot rotate the check valve adapter to unscrew it from the boiler. So what is wrong with this adapter? As I've just mentioned, I made it originally just for the hand pump, screwed into the end of the first part of the adapter. Then I made an extension and screwed that in place as well. I need the new design to support two 5 16 by 32 check valves, and be able to be removed and refit if ever required. I still have to slacken the banjo union on the pressure gauge, but that's easy enough. This banjo union holds the pressure gauge siphon in place, as you can see, and once it's slackened, I can rotate the siphon out of the way. Then I can easily unscrew the original adapter from the bush in the boiler, which is only quarter by 40 threads per inch, which in my opinion is far too small. This boiler would have been a lot better if it was fitted with 5 16 by 32 boiler bushes, for both the check valve and the steam taps. But it isn't, it was manufactured to use quarter by 40 bushes. Here's the old adapter, and here it is separated into its component parts. There's nothing wrong with these two check valves, other than the marks to the paint when I fitted them to the adapter. But when I make the new adapter, I think I'll use a couple of new ones. And both of the new check valves will be the 5 16 by 32 threads per inch type. I was going to make the new check valve out of this piece of metal, which I do believe to be alum bronze, but the extra weight of two larger check valves, I feel, needs an adapter that is stronger. These quarter by 40 threads per inch bushes really are too small for a boiler of 6 inches in diameter. I need to drill the hole in the fitting as large as possible, but retain its strength. For this reason, I'm going to use a piece of stainless steel, here I'm checking that this piece of steel is stainless, and yes it is, it is non-magnetic. I'm going to turn this piece of steel using my Boxford lathe, because it's a bit bigger than the Myford and much smaller than the Smart and Brown. Over now to the Boxford lathe, and the job begins. Turning stainless steel can be difficult. Rule 1, use very sharp tools. Rule 2, once you start cutting, continue cutting. This is a bit of a problem in this case. The noise you can hear is my three-phase converter complaining. It never used to do this until I moved into this small village where I currently live. The main supply is a bit low on a Sunday lunchtime when everybody's cooking Sunday dinner. I did two things to cure this. I wound back the top slide to take a shallower cut and applied some cutting lubricant. The lathe tool cut much better, but after a while this happened. A lot of swarf wrapped around the work and lashing round in the chuck, which is not a very good idea. That's why I never stand directly in line with the chuck. Well, most of the time anyway. You must not, under any circumstances, remove the swarf using your fingers. Instead, use a sensible method, a pair of pliers, and just pull it away from the work. Move the cutting tool out of the way and drop all the swarf into the chip tray. As the diameter of the piece of stainless steel diminishes, you can take deeper cuts. It's all down to speeds and feeds. With a modern carbide tip tool like this one, 
It's not 100% essential to use cutting lubricant, but if you don't, the stainless steel starts to get very hot. And also this lathe tool has a negative rake, and this makes it more difficult to cut through the metal. I do not use industrial lathe coolant in my home workshop. I just don't like the smell of it, and it lingers. A friend of mine is an engineer, and whenever I meet up with him, he smells of lathe coolant. A lot of the things I do in the workshop are 100% by feel, which is not the best way to do it, but it does work for me. In this clip, I'm positioning the check valves on the work to make sure I've machined enough away to allow me to screw them into position side by side so they don't foul each other. According to my calculations, by holding the check valves in position, I need to remove a little bit more metal. So here I'm doing just that in steps. I have no idea what type of stainless steel this is. I don't know what the number is or anything about it because it came out of a small box of stainless steel pieces that I have that came from a scrapyard 45 years ago. I don't want this fitting to be too big, too heavy, overscale and clumsy. So here is the final full length cut to reduce it to the diameter that I want it to be. The next step is to reduce the end to quarter of an inch and thread it quarter by 40 threads per inch. I do not want this to be undersized, so frequent checks with the micrometer are necessary. I am, however, allowing for the fact that the metal is hot, and here I'm using a parting tool to make sure I have a perfect square edge. This is the finishing cut, it's a little oversized, and I reduce it with some emery cloth, keeping my hands well cleared of the chuck, of course. Don't forget, this piece of metal is hot, and with the heat it's bigger than it should be, so I'm making sure that the micrometer is a tight fit on it. Here I'm threading the end of the bar using a tailstock die holder and I'm threading it under power in the lathe. The lathe is in back gear and it is running very slowly. It's not very clear in this clip the camera's too far away, but it's a very good thread. I confirm this by screwing a quarter by 40 threads per inch nut onto the thread and it's got no shake, rattle or roll. I'm using the emery cloth again to remove the sharp edges because don't forget a perfect 90 degree cut is razor sharp. I've just center drilled the end of the work and now I'm using a 5 30 seconds of an inch diameter twist drill to drill a hole all the way down the bar or at least down the bar where it's been turned. A word of caution here, in fact no, a word of warning. If you do this wrong, you will do two things. You will break off the drill inside the work, which is the worst case scenario, and you have to listen to what's happening rather than see it. The most important part of drilling or machining stainless steel is to keep the drill or cutting tool moving at all times. If it rubs, the stainless steel work hardens, then you have a problem, and I mean a real problem. Way back in 1999, I built a Land Rover from scratch on a galvanised chassis and I used quite a lot of stainless steel parts which had to be drilled. And the drill bits that I was using were much larger than this. And during the building of the Land Rover I destroyed three perfectly good drill bits as the end of them glowed red once the stainless steel had work hardened. The rule here with such a small drill bit is to use plenty of lubricant and withdraw the drill frequently to get rid of the chippings. If it starts to make a crackling or crunching noise, stop drilling and withdraw the drill bit to remove the chippings. Do not hesitate, be positive and push the drill through the work. I hadn't allowed for the thickness of the parting tool, so here I'm removing just a tiny bit more metal and this is now the finished dimension. I also used the emery cloth once again to get rid of the sharp edges on the front. You will notice that the finish on the metal from the cutting tool is very good indeed. Now it's time to part off the piece of stainless steel that I need. The lathe is running in back gear, which means it's running slowly and I'm using plenty of lubricant. Initially though I didn't for the purpose of the video, the golden rule, once again, is when you're cutting stainless steel, 
is to always apply constant pressure to the tool and do not under any circumstances let it rub on the stainless steel, otherwise you have a problem. Even though the parting tool was cutting quite well I didn't want to blunt it and with lots of lubricant the job was a success and the part fell into the chip tray. When it was cool I picked it out of the chip tray and reversed it in the chuck. I chamfered the edges slightly, then I took a facing cut across the front, being very careful when I removed the centre pip. After a quick reverse pass to make sure it was flat, and then I refaced the end and got a really good finish. You can see clearly in this clip that my cutting tool is precisely at the right height. That is it for this episode. The hole is drilled down the centre, not all the way through. In the next episode I will be drilling and threading the part to take the check valves, and indeed fitting them. Stay safe, stay healthy, thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful. Please take the time to visit my Mainsteam Models website, and click on the section of the website that says Video Playlists, and by doing that you can find other videos that you may like to watch. And by using the playlists, you can actually watch the videos back to back.